My name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm the founder and executive director of Designers for Learning. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to give people opportunities to gain volunteer experience while at the same time helping underserved educational needs. This video is one in a series of interviews I conducted to gather additional perspectives as part of our Design in the Open Challenge, a professional development opportunity we're offering to explore ways to cultivate your professional presence in your chosen field. In this interview, I'm speaking with Kristen Anthony, a freelance learning experience designer. Our conversation is inspired by themes forwarded in the book, Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. In this conversation, we contemplate two themes of the book, including theme four, open up your cabinet of curiosities, and theme eight, learn to take a punch. We join the conversation as Kristen provides us with her bio. Hey everybody, it's Kristen here. Um, I am a learning experience designer. That's how I style myself. I have about four going on five years of experience in a variety of industries. But you know, I just realized um, that I've actually spent most of my instructional design career in uh, professional development, which is weird because nobody talks about that space uh, specifically. Um, so you can imagine coming in as a, as a newbie newbie and being like, none of these things actually fit what I'm doing. Um, so there's that. Uh, but I uh, host the Dear Instructional Designer podcast, which unfortunately has been on hiatus, but it's a wonderful project. Uh, and I'm also a beginning web developer and game developer. So really, really love the development side of instructional design, <laughs> probably more than I should. Uh, but that, that is where I hang my hat. That's what I love to do. And I am happy to be here. Yeah, well, trust me, I'm happy to have you. <laughs> Just before I turn the recording on, I was laughing with Kristen. It's, tr it's, it's turning the tables. Uh, I was a, um, a guest on her podcast, uh, I guess it's probably almost two years ago now, and yeah. I had the opportunity to talk about Designers for Learning, and kind of in our infancy there, what we were trying to do, what we were trying to come across. And I think our um, goals matched each other in that at that point, uh, you, and I think even to this day, your belief is that the best way to learn how to design is to design. And yeah. that's our philosophy too. It's so, you know, gain experience for good you know, by doing. And uh, so I periodically poke around on um, Kristen's blog and keep up with her podcasts. And I came across an older post from around probably 2014 and 15 when our book came out in our class to show your work. So this class would not be had I not seen on Kristen's blog that she had reviewed the book, Show Your Work by Austin Kleon, um, which again, as, as we all know at this point, that's the, the inspiration for the course that, um, that we're talking about today. And so the two principles or themes that we're gonna talk about today that I asked Kristen to try to focus on it as we're talking through our conversation today is the fourth and the eighth. So the fourth being open up your cabinet of curiosities and the eighth being learn to take a punch because I think she probably has a lot of good insight on, on both of those. Um, so one thing that I just wanted to do to frame our conversation, um, we hear a lot from, from people who are new to the field and the advice given to people who are, who are new to the field is fake it until you make it. And I've always, that has always rubbed me the wrong way. It's kind of like nails on the chalkboard when I hear that. And so what I tend to think about it instead is like share it while you make it. So, you, you know, kind of acknowledge that you're new and you're learning and here's something I'm trying and here's the things that happened as I did it. And if you read Kristen's blog, in my opinion, as a reader and part of her audience, that's what I get from that is that I'm trying something new and I'm sharing it as I make it. Um, so that kind of is the premise of our conversation today and the things that I'd like to talk about. Um, you know, Kristen, if you could um, kind of help us think through this idea of opening up your cabinet of curiosities and I'll I'll just give a really quick quote from Cleon's book that I think frames this topic really well. So if you're not ready to take the leap of sharing your own work in the world, you can share your taste with uh, the work of, share your taste in the work of others. And again, I think this is, as, a, as an aside, I think this is where Kristen does a great job. Where do you get your inspiration? What sorts of things fill your, do you fill your head with? What do you read? What do you subscribe to? What sites on the internet do you visit? And um, again, this whole concept of sharing it while you make it and sharing it as you learn it, teaching it as you learn it is, I think, what Kristen's all about. So if you could just kind of um, expound on that a little bit and kind of give us your, your thoughts about um, this idea of reading what others do and sharing it and, and, and kind of internalizing it and making it your own. Yeah, so um, 
way back when, when I got my first instructional design job, I knew nothing, uh, obviously. Uh, I had, I had um, what, what I always like to say is that I had these, these great supervisors and they had a process that propped me up in my ignorance. So, but from there I started, you know, I was thinking, I like what I'm doing, I wanna be better at it. And so I started actively seeking out webinars and, and blogs and, and things like that to help me be better at instructional design. And definitely what I started with was um, the Articulate e-learning blog. And I, be, the reason why I started with that one, that, that resonated the most with me because in a world where the thought leaders Again, my, my own experience, but where it felt like to me as a newbie, I had people telling me, you're doing instructional design wrong. You need to be doing it this way. And I'm like, but I don't know anything and I'm an individual contributor. I can't just go up to somebody and say, uh, no, we're not going to make a course because you haven't told me X, Y, and Z. I can't do that. Um, so I, you know, if someone says to me, we're making a course, I'm like, yeah, yeah, we are. We're making a course. Um, and the, I felt like the Articulate blog was one of the only resources out there at that time that said, you're not in a perfect world. People are going to hand down courses to you. And here is how you can make the best of that by trying to do these little tiny interactives and things like that. So that resonated a lot with me. Um, the other thing that I did was, joined the free version of the e-learning guild um, and, and did a lot of their webinars, in particular the, the ones from Allen Interactions, um, that sort of CCAF um, context challenge activity feedback framework was really, really helpful getting started. So those were the two things that I read up front. And as I was doing that, I started thinking, well, if I'm going to, you know, make this, make a career out of this. I need to be practicing outside of work. And I've talked about this a little bit on my blog is that, you know, no other design field, whether that's graphic design or, or UX, no other design field would say, you know, your work is nine to five. And so all you're going to do is you're going to go to work and you're going to get stuff done. And then after work, you, you know, you can just go do whatever you know those people are practicing constantly they have behance and they have dribble um, and they have other portfolio sites where they are they are trying to get better at their craft constantly outside of work and i i feel that that's really important for us as well um you know and you you could say well instructional design isn't e-learning development and i would absolutely agree with you but for 99.9% .9 of us, that is a big part of the job. And being able to work with the tools, being able to develop things quickly and, and develop interesting things quickly um, is, is definitely something that sets you apart. And so it, to me, it seemed like, well, it's really important for me to, to read a lot and to practice a lot. So those, those were the things that sort of were the impetus for me building a portfolio. And then I said, you know, inspired sort of by Austin Cleon is you want to get you want to get that that space on the internet and and talk about it and I just I want it to as a newbie it can feel like well other people are better at talking about this um and you know sure they are but your perspective as just one step ahead of that person that is also a newbie is completely valuable and so talking about in a transparent way I had a bad day at work yeah. because, you know, I was really frustrated by this and I don't know enough. And so I'm trying to read um, that. It was cathartic for me, but I, I didn't want to do it in a, in a sort of complaining way. I wanted to do it in a way of I'm frustrated and I don't know what I'm doing, but here's what I'm going to try and do better next time. So it's, it's a, that reflective piece. Um, is absolutely what I think showing your work is about. You know, it, even if you say nobody's going to read, that's fine, whatever. But for you, going through that process of reflection on what you're doing, what you think you're doing wrong, what you think you did really well, too, um, is just so, so helpful in your journey as you go along. Yeah. And I just, before we um, logged on today, I went back to your blog. Cause I, like I said, I just periodically poke in there cause I could spend days just going through. And I don't know how old this post is. Maybe you'll recall, but you did a post on developing an app 
And so that's just something that I'm thinking about doing. And so I'm right at the place you are when you thought it had that thought in your head. And so it's such an inspiration. And as you said, the, the, your, reading your reflections and your authenticity as you're talking about the challenges, because I think your first line or two was something like, I can't develop an app, you know, like that's crazy. Why, you know, how am I just going to go from zero to producing an app um, that, that someone would actually be able to use? And so I do think um, there's so many layers to that process. One is your reflection. Yeah, you're documenting it and you're taking the time to step back. Um, but also there's this uh, that, that teach component that comes in that for people like myself that come along and I do that all the time on your as I said this, this, this course wouldn't be here had I not you know said hey you know what I think we could riff on this idea for a while in a class and is in fact again before I logged on today I get these calls or uh, contacts all the time on LinkedIn someone said to me I'm in uh, a different field but I feel like getting you know migrating over to instructional design what do I need need so there's a ton of us out, out there. There are people like yourself that, um, as you said, you, this is not the field that you initially chose, but it's kind of the field you, you, you know, entered into. So you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And I, I just think that's really, it comes through in what you just said and, and also in your work. You've you got to start somewhere and don't feel embarrassed by what you don't know, but instead use it as almost a teachable moment for others. And then, as you said, the, the reflective part of it as well. Yeah. Um, so when you're thinking, sitting down and you're, and it's a really interesting talk process with people. We've tried to do this on all of our, um, all of our interviews, but if you have an idea for a blog post or which comes first, I guess the, the project you're working on or like kind of thinking, Oh, this is something I think that would be cool to talk about on a podcast or a blog as far as what, what you work on. Um, it depends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so sometimes I, uh, so I spend a lot of time on the instructional design subreddit. Uh, and sometimes something there will uh, sort of make me think uh, more deeply and, and then I'll write a blog post on it. So case in point, uh, I, I am recently reading uh, Kathy Moore's Map It. And, uh, and I'm also working with a, a client uh, on yet more professional development. And I... I I asked Kathy Moore on Twitter, you know, does action mapping apply to PD? And she sent me to the interactive that she's created for that. And the, the, uh, when I went through it, the answer that I got was maybe. And that, that really made me think, you know, you think you, you would realize this about yourself, but like I said, it made me really consciously understand that I have spent my entire career helping organizations create professional development for sale. So mm -hmm. I'm not in corporate learning, uh, you know, where I have an audience that I can say, you know, we have these certain key performance indicators that we can measure. And I'm not in academia where I can just use backwards design. I'm in this completely other space. And it just hit me. Nobody has actually talked about that. Ah. So that, you know, when I thought about that and, and that, that kept being on my mind, then I wrote a blog post about, you know, what can we do to move towards some kind of repeatable framework for success for the PD space? Um, and in other situations where, for example, I'm working, when I was working on that, uh, that app, which was just recently, I, I started doing that for the last um, XAPI cohort that just ended on December the 8th. Um, I thought, well, I'm doing something I don't know uh, anything about. So people might be interested in that. You know, um, a lot of us, again, with development work, more and more of that is coming on our shoulders. And even if you were to hire out for somebody to create an app, just I thought it might be interesting for people to read about my hardships um, in creating an XAPI enabled app. Um, and even just starting that on your own, you know, like there's, there's this wonderful framework that if you know a little bit of JavaScript, you can do this. Like you can actually do this. Someone who's not by any means some kind of uh, programming genius can actually go from zero to published app in the app store um, within two to three months um, if, if you just work on it. So in that case, the project came first and then I thought, well, I wanna, I wanna show my work there. 
Um, so, but <laughs> one of the things that I, I struggle with um, sometimes is that I, it would probably be better for me if I were to actually like live stream or take <laughs> notes throughout the process. So a lot of times what happens is then I'm like, oh yeah, I want to, I want to work on this and I work on the thing. And then I'm like, oh, well, I, I want to share this because people might be interested in, in the struggles that I had. And then I'm like, what struggles did I have? You can't remember uh, what you did, yeah. what you're, what you're yeah. thinking as you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I was like, I know I had like 15 million stuck points in this app project, um, but I think I got the major ones. Um, but definitely, if you're thinking about sharing your work, doing some of that live streaming or even just, just, just recording yourself, even if you don't live stream it or, or taking notes throughout the process, it's helpful. And again, even if you were to never share that online the reflective piece is just so important and and to make that more concrete it's not only reflection for just yourself but those those you know maddening interview questions about what what was the hardest project you worked on right yeah that's what that's for you know yeah. you can come back to that and tell those stories right you know you you're hitting on a perfect segue because one of the questions um, that i really want to talk to you about this is whole idea of audience and you've touched on it a little bit but uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of folks that join the course who aren't on Twitter for a lot of reasons, probably a lot of good reasons. There's some, you know, wild, wild west. Even though it's been around for 10 years, there's some stuff that I, some aspects of it. And you're on Reddit, as you said, so I'm sure you can make your way down to parts of Reddit that you're not interested in and staying very long. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of folks going, wow, can I do what Kristen's doing but not put it out there? So just, you know, journal it or share it with a, sm a smaller non-internet based audience or something like so what kind of what are your thoughts on that as far as audience in terms of what you decided to share and then do you think your process would be as effective if, if you didn't put it out on the internet but just did it as the something that you do personally i i think the answer to that is yes um the the process of talking about your thinking um I think is just it's so beneficial for you as someone on a journey um, that even even if you never shared it with anyone else um, in any kind of formal way it's still going to benefit you a great deal um, that said I think the benefit of putting it out there is that you know my my blog and my portfolio have been the number one way that people reach me not not only um you know possible employers or clients but also just uh a network like i have all these people who i can talk to about my my problems uh, or my successes as they happen um and i can do that again let's say you don't want to be on on social networks you know i i um not recently, but within the last year, year and a half, I read Cal Newport's Deep Work, where he talks about uh, issuing these sort of social media things because the, the benefit that they might bring might not necessarily um, outweigh their, um, their detriments. And so I've been thinking a lot about that as well. But let's say you didn't want to be on social networks. That's fine. Just, just putting it out there. And the other thing is just completing a thing, you know, if it's project based, completing a thing and then putting it out there. That that cycle of uh, production and, and release um, is also just really important um, as as someone, as people who create things that other people are going to use. You know, if you never practice that, if you're always like, it's not done, then how are you going to let it go at work um, or, or with a client? So. Um, Again, I, I think super beneficial to just go through the process on your own. It's, it's good for your journey. It's good for collecting the stories that you can tell when someone wants to, to ask you an interview question or something like that. But there's definitely a benefit to putting it out there in the world. Yeah, and you made, I think we kind of glossed over, but I think when you were talking, if I, if I understood you correctly, you said you had a question out about, about a book you were reading and you talked to the author on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. So, yeah, I mean, you can't, there aren't many ways to do that unless, you know, you use some form of internet-based communication. You're probably going to drive to her house. They'd be a little creepy, actually, <laughs> like go talk to her. So, I mean, but that's the, you know, I, I talk a lot about um, what we do as being messy and magical. You know, yeah, there's kind of this messier part of it, 
but you touched on a couple, well, I actually touched on like five things I'd love to spend tons of time on, but um, this whole idea of, I, I always share with my class is almost at the midpoint of every class is perfect is the enemy of good and done. Yeah. And if you wait until in your head it's perfect to release it into the wild, you're, um, you're never going to get done. <laughs> it's never going to be done. And there's so much to be gained by having that back and forth. And as you said, we've heard it on a couple interviews already is people have landed projects. They've found collaborators, um, get referrals because people know, know their work. So yeah, yeah that, that's the pros. So now <laughs> let's take for our next 15 minutes as we are winding down. We don't talk the whole time about negatives, but the other piece of, um, of the other theme that we, I wanted to cover with you from, from the book is this idea of learning to take a punch. And so whether you tie it into your openness in, in your practice or just kind of um, from your experiences, um, let me just kind of share with you real quick before I move, uh, frame my question. Here's a quote that I love from Cleon's blog. It says, when you put your work out into the world, you have to be ready for the good, the bad, and the ugly. The more people come across your work, the more criticism you'll face. The way you'll be able to take a punch is to practice getting hit a lot. Put out, uh, put out a lot of work, let people take their best shot, um, then make even more work and keep putting it out there. The more criticism you take, the more you realize you can't get hurt. So any personal anecdotes that you might want to share without naming names or getting too, you know, more detail than you could care to care to uh, share with us today. But how do you feel about that idea that, yeah, you throw stuff out there and you're going to get people who say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about or whatever it may be. Any, any examples along that line? Uh, so first I want to say as a whole, the instructional design community is very nice. Yeah, um, right. Probably a little more nice than we should be. Uh, I, I think honest, um, helpful critique when someone puts out a portfolio project would actually be more helpful in our community. Um, but that said, I probably probably the the biggest the biggest uh, critique I've received was when I wrote a blog post about um, never having been to a conference, um, but that I, I'm still able to learn without it. And I, I got a lot of people from the conference industry that are like, well, uh, because part of that was, um, was me saying, well, I, you know, I haven't been able to get a conference session uh, actually accepted mm -hmm. as a newbie. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, you probably didn't do it right essentially um and so one of the one of the things that uh i think is actually a benefit of, of having online communication is that i don't know about you guys but i can take critique a lot better in writing uh because i do not have a poker face uh so <laughs> it's to me it's very helpful to get that stuff in writing and so then i can go and curse and rant and rave and then come back and say okay what's true here uh, what what can I actually take back from here that's useful? Um, and I, I think that's the thing, you know, uh, again, a lot of folks here aren't in, in our industry aren't, they're not going to rip you to shreds. But if you get useful critique, even if it, if you're pissed off about it up front, uh, particularly when it's in writing, you can have that moment and then come back and reflect and if you want to respond, you can do that in a measured way because you're also going to be responding in writing. Um, so that's just incredibly helpful. And you know, the other thing that I, I think I've learned, and this is sort of more nebulous, but again, like I was talking about up front, as, as a newbie newbie, when I kept hearing all of these uh, thought leaders say that you shouldn't be doing instructional design this way, I just felt really frustrated and defeated um, until I realized, you know, they're in, they're in their environment and they're not in mine. And so what I need to do is take what works and leave the rest of it. If somebody is giving you a critique that doesn't fit um, your particular environment, for example, if they're saying, well, you really should have asked these questions up front and you know that when someone tells you you're going to make a course that you don't get to ask, uh, should we really be making this course? Then, you know, that's not helpful to you. You just sort of file that away. Um, so I, it, it's absolutely important for us to be able to 
to take critique I, and, and putting things out there um, is incredibly helpful and asking for helpful critique, I think is also the thing because you, you do want that. It, when, it's, when it's good critique, um, instead of uh, either on the positive side, hey, good job, or on the negative side, uh, I don't what are you doing? Um, when, it, when it's really helpful critique, that moves you forward. Um, and, and it might not feel good in the moment, but it, it absolutely moves you forward. And that's, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and it, again, I, I just feel like, you know, maybe in some other industries, you might have people that are more nasty, but I have not really faced anything that I would consider just really, really nasty. Yeah. And I think, I, I'm so glad you're saying this because in all the design classes we talk, uh, we teach, We've got the design process includes a lot of storyboarding and it includes a lot of prototyping. And as I say, every time I'm just a broken record, I can't give you feedback on a blank piece of paper. You know, like people are freaked out. They miss the deadline. They don't want to send it in. Yeah. So I hope everyone walks away with this idea. If you've been doing this forever and you've never had anybody like really hurt your feelings and probably the opposite, you're really hoping you could get more feedback. Hopefully that's a great takeaway, if nothing else, um, from this. And so one, one thing I wanted to talk about um, in this whole idea, in this whole vein of putting something out there and getting feedback um, so you can better your work and also just as, as Cleon talks about kind of learn to take your punches because it's some even if it's cons constructive criticism it still hurts if you think you yeah. did something great and you get it back yeah um, so can you tell tell us a little bit about you mentioned a couple of places where you go to, to do your practice and I think one is is it the articulate is that, um, is that where you do it the um, challenges or I did I definitely use that a lot as a newbie yeah so that was one site. And then I think you even, and you can talk about this as much or little as you want, you were even thinking about going down the path of setting up your own challenges uh, as a, for, uh, as for design practitioners to give a, a shot at different things. So can you talk a little bit about that, this whole benefit and the challenges of, uh, or, or setting up a challenge and then participating in a challenge? Yeah. Um, so the benefit just generally is time boxing yourself, right? You, you give yourself a deadline, whatever that looks for you, because consistency is the key to building your skills to a point where, and I'll give you an example. Um, I started learning JavaScript in my first, uh, my first real ID job, uh, because I thought, you know, this is, this is something that would be helpful for me. Um, I was using Lectora, 11 and 12 at the time. And I knew that that would allow me to use JavaScript. And I thought, well, how much more could I do if I could push Lectora beyond the boundaries? Um, and so I started learning that um, and, and trying to do work with it. And because I was practicing outside of work with those challenges, when something came up at work and they were like, you know, what we really need to be able to do um, is to have participants trace this fingerprint on the screen um, and uh, to give you context that we were talking about it, it was a fingerprinting course for law enforcement about how to how to actually look at fingerprint evidence and and um, match it and things like that and so that that requires some uh, really detailed looks at the actual fingerprint and does this match this one and they wanted people to be able to go through this tracing process on the fingerprints. Now, if I hadn't practiced outside or if I hadn't done any sort of self-development outside, I would have said, and no, we can't do that. Yeah. Um, but because I had, I could say, oh, I can go and get myself a jQuery plugin, put that in Lectora, and voila, we can do that. And I was able to do that within half a day. Wow. You know? And we, we got that done, something that nobody else would have been able to do at that particular job. Not that I'm super great, but at that particular job, nobody else would have been able to get that done. Um, but because I practiced um, outside of work and developed myself outside of work, I absolutely was able to get that done. And so, um, sorry, uh, it's just, the, the important thing is to, um, give yourself these little tiny challenges that you can actually meet on a consistent basis. For me, I was, I was trying to do that once a month. That's something that I could do realistically and consistently. If for you, that's once a quarter um, or you know something else in between, 
then do that. It's just give yourself this project. And the other thing that it does, like you were talking about, is that it, it forces you to say, I am going to release this at the end of that. I, you know, you don't give yourself the luxury of, oh, well, I'm going to start on this project and then I'm going to peter out. Or, oh, I'm going to start on this project and I'm going to get it to a place, but I'm not happy with it, so I'm just going to let it rot. Um, put it out there at the end of that, that challenge season um, so that you get, you get used to, again, even without the critique, although I'd say that that's, that's super important as well, but even without the critique, getting used to that process of, and now I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to put it out there is just really, really essential. So for um, our last uh, five minutes or so, I think would be super helpful then from to kind of tie in everything you talked about through that whole conversation of like putting something out there to practice and setting up challenges. Do you have any recommendations for good entry points for people? Like where, if, if you were just now starting out, kind of knowing what you know of the landscape, where where's a good place to point people in the right direction to to try to do that either from the challenge side of things or where to put your work like do you recommend are you still recommending to people do a blog or maybe create a podcast or you know kind of soup to nuts from where do you find your, your challenges all the way through to where would you recommend as a good entry point for people to start getting their work out there so probably the easiest entry point for a lot of us is those articulate challenges um they they're small, they're simple, they have a great community. So you're going to get, um, again, it's, it's the kind of feedback of great job, but yeah. it's there and that, you know, that gets you going. Um, for myself, as I started um, dealing with other tool sets and learning how to code and wanting to sort of move away from rapid e-learning tools, um, I found that those, they didn't really meet my needs and wants. Um, so one of the things that I created was, um, go design something.co which has briefs where you go in there and you, you refresh the page and you get a little brief um, of a type of project that you could do um, and so that's another great place to get started uh, the other thing that uh, not to promote myself too much but I, I actually created a course and then released it for free about building a portfolio and you know, as I was creating it, I, I started thinking very deeply about this question of where can people get started? And there are just so many options there. You know, you can, you can collect your own, um, you know, great big list of things that you, you want to try, whether it's, I want to try this tiny interaction or I want to try to make a text-based adventure game. Um, you can look at uh, civic learning or civic tech projects. Um, so in, in a lot of places, there are these civic tech organizations like Code for America, where they're trying to solve civic problems um, all together with, with free and open source code. And so sometimes those problems have a, a training component. And so you might be able to latch on to that and, and find a problem that way. Volunteering your services with the Designers for Learning and, and other sorts of things um, where you get another uh, crack at a, a real world problem that you can take advantage of. You know, there, there are just these, a myriad of ways for you to get started. Um, and I talk about that in my portfolio course. Now, as far as where to put it online, I absolutely agree with Austin Cleon, and, and I stole this from him, is that I really do agree with having your own little piece of the internet out there. I think it's really, really helpful to have your own website. Um, and you, you don't have to do a blog if you don't want to. Um, or, you know, you could do podcasts, which is, you know, video blog, or you could do a podcast, or you could just, you know, not do anything. You could just use social media, whatever. But having that portfolio space is absolutely essential. Like I was saying, you know, every single opportunity that I have gotten as a as a, a newbie freelancer has, and, and even most of my opportunities for jobs have been based on the strength of my portfolio mm -hmm. that is out there. Um, and in my course, I also talk about how you want to structure your portfolio um, and the story you want to tell around your portfolio pieces. Cause this goes back to what we were talking about before that reflection that you do as you're um, working through your portfolio pieces that should come out in your portfolio. Um, you should be able to tell the story of this piece and how it fit the problem that you were trying to solve right there. So um, lots of different places to get started. 
if you're just starting out, go ahead and go to those articulate challenges. Um, and if you're looking for creating a portfolio, definitely get some web hosting. Yeah, it, it, that's going to be for sure one of the things in the course we talk about. Um, do a vanity search of yourself, and uh, if you don't, if you're not showing up uh, on the top, your work-related things aren't showing in, up at the top. You really got to work on that. And probably, yeah. as you're saying, the best way to do it is buy your own URL or something close to your name, and, um, and make sure that that's populated with stuff. Pretty. And so, when you, people do a search, as they inevitably will do when they meet you, uh, and especially if it's a new employer or a potential collaborator, they're going to want to see what your professional life is all about. And the more you can kind of push your own stuff up by having your own space. So, well, thank you so much, Kristen. I cannot even tell you how I'm, you have truly changed my direction in so many ways of what I'm doing. And you've been such a help all the way along. I can't tell you how many, how many times I probably send you emails and just you know, impromptu <laughs> say, what about a free and open source way to do this or whatever it may be. So from, a, from my heart, I truly thank you so much for what you do for our greater community and what you've done for us. And thank you for joining us here today as well. So hopefully others I will certainly take your course. That's going to be certainly in our show notes. We're going to tell people about your uh, how to create a portfolio and point them to your blog and Twitter and all the places you are online. So thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you very much. Really glad to be here. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.